Hi, everybody, and thank you for giving me the occasion of speaking here. Uh, what I'm talking about is essentially a framework for uh, doing image processing, exploiting the structure of the semi-discrete group of rotor translation. So this is a joint work with uh, Jean-Paul Gauthier and Hugo Boscan. Now, I will start my talk by speaking about a mathematical model of the primary visual cortex of a human being, of mammalians, that is the motivation essentially for our study. Then I will present you some of the results that we obtained in imaging painting and some of the results we obtained in image recognition exploiting the structure of this group. So, yeah. Let me start with the mathematical model of the primary visual cortex. So the primary visual cortex is this area of the brain and it's the first area of the brain that receives information from the retina. So it has been well studied and in fact, what we know since the 80s is that uh, the primary visual cortex has neurons that are sensible not only to positions in the retinal plane, but also to the local orientation, essentially. So as you see here, we have a picture of the primary visual cortex of a uh, tree shrew, and uh, you have the colors that represent uh, orientation preference of the neurons. So we have various different orientation preferences, and we want to exploit this fact, essentially. So, so, okay, very slow. Okay, so what we say is that we can conjecture, it's an educated guess, that indeed the primary visual cortex is sensible to a finite number of directions. That means, well, in our experiments we use 30, but it could be 100, 150, but anyway, it's finite. And so we can represent the primary visual cortex as R2 times the discrete group Zn over 2, essentially. So what does it mean? It means that each point there we represent a position and the specific orientation of that neuron, okay, as we have here. Uh, and we call, above each point, we call the neurons that are sensible to that point, but different orientations are called normally hypercolumns. So. So what do we mean? What, what do we need? Okay, essentially we will work now with SE2N, that is for us R2 times Zn, where Zn is the discrete rotation group, and well, it has its semi-direct product low, it's locally compact and non-commutative, and this will play a big role in the sequel. And it's the double covering of V1, because in V1 we only consider orientations, so we have to, well, we have to consider only Zn over 2. And here, on this group, we are interested essentially in the action of this group above function on, on himself, that would be the uh, cortical stimuli that is given by the left regular representation, as usual. And then we have the quasi-regular representation that is the action of this group on functions on the retinal plane, that is essentially the action of rotor translations in the retinal plane for images. So, the important th an important thing to think, to speak about is the receptive fields. That means how can we lift uh, an image from the retinal plane to our group, to the visual cortex. So normally in uh, neuroscience as well, they noticed that essentially to each neuron you can associate a function that is psi of xk here that gives the response to that neuron to a stimulus in the retina as the formula that we have here. Now, a good fit for this psi is simply a Gabor filter that is a sinusoid modulated modul, modul by a Gaussian function that is centered on, a, on, a, on the point and it has a certain orientation. Now, this essentially amounts to choose the Gabor filter with centering zero and with orientation zero and to translate it via the quasi-regular representation. Now, this is a picture of a Gabor filter more or less and this is what you get taken from Wikipedia essentially, what you get when you apply differently oriented Gabor filters to an image. So they catch, they capture the information about the orientations on the lines, and that's very important for us. And so to put it in a framework, more a group theoretical framework, let's say what we are interested in actually are what are called left invariant lift operators. That means are operators that interwines the left regular representation with the quasi-regular one. That means that if we have a lifted function and we apply the action of IC2N, it's the same thing as lifting the same function but 
to which we applied the action of SH1N when before doing the lift, essentially. So, okay, it's um, quite simple to prove that indeed, if we take a lift operator that is the left invariant, is linear, and satisfies some regularity properties, then we know that we can represent it as a receptive field, essentially, and essentially as what is called the wavelet transform with respect to a certain wavelet fixed in L2 of R2. Okay. So this tells us also that receptive fields through Gabor filters, that is what is used normally, define indeed a left invariant lift. That's all we need morally. Now, what are the advantages of this kind of approach? So first of all, it allows us to essentially resolve problems with crossing. As you see, if we have an image where we have a lot of crossings, when we lift it to the retinal plane, to, the, to V1 essentially, we will see the three lines that are crossing in the image to the left as separate things in the three-dimensional space. Now, this also gives a natural formulation of problems in, that are invariant under rotations and translations. In particular, we're interested in rotations here. And it allows us to do a better Fourier analysis with respect to the continuous case in the sense that here we have some properties, some good properties of irreducible representations on this group that in particular are all finite dimensional while in SE2 they would be all infinite dimensional, essentially. So, how can we apply this to imaging painting? So, we have an image that is corrupted, we want to reconstruct it. How can we do that? Well, again, we can think of it as an example of what is called an illusory contour. So, if you look at the picture that you have here on your left, this is the Canista triangle, you see clearly, well, maybe it's too big for you to see, but you see clearly that there is a triangle, even if it's not traced down there. So we can do, essentially, a neurophysiological assumption, that is, again, an educated guess, that what our brain is doing is to reconstruct this image, for example, through the natural diffusion that we have on neuron. Okay, neurons are connected in some ways, and this connection is what makes you see the triangle, probably. And so, what is this evolution that we have on V1? Essentially, what we know is that neurons can be connected in two diverse ways. On one side, we have lateral connections. That, that means that neurons are sensible to different points are connected along the lines of their uh, preferred orientation. And this can be represented as this vector field X here. But also, we have also local connections in the sense that neurons inside the same hypercolumn are connected between them and they transmit information. So now, for example, here you see a picture where a stimuli has been injected to a neuron that is uh, of a preferred orientation, blue, essentially. And you see very well that this, you see very well that this distributes, this, this stimulus distributes along the same upper column, so with different colors, but it also jumps to the same color along the line, essentially, of the stimuli. Now, to represent this, Essentially, we represent this kind of evolution via a stochastic process where the lateral connections are simply the vector field X time the Brown, a Brownian motion, a Wiener process, plus some jump process that represents the connections in the hypercolumn. Now, we, simple math shows you that the infinitesimal, the infinitesimal generator of this process is this operator Ln, and this allows us to write down an hyperliptic equation for the evolution of a stimulus. So I want to stress that this evolution is uh, highly anisotropic in the sense that uh, we, only are, we are connecting only along two directions in a space that is morally three-dimensional. Okay, so uh, this is it. And also that is invariant under the action of SE2N here. So this allows us to write a simple image reconstruction algorithm, simply saying that we take an image, we, well, we do a Gaussian filter, which is mounted by a Gaussian filter, as the retina is supposed to do, we lift it to V1, we evolve the lifted function through the spontaneous semi-discrete evolution that I've just described, and then we project down, for example, normally we project down with taking the maximum along the upper column, but you can think of uh, projecting with the sum or with some LP norm, it's gonna be the same. So this, in particular, the second point, so the evolution, is pretty fast and parallelizable thanks to Fourier transform techniques that we can apply to SE2N. So it's reasonable 
the results that we get for small corruptions, although we are actually, since we are using an evolution on the whole image, of course, we are corrupting, we are modifying the image where it wasn't corrupted at the beginning. But yeah, if we had some heuristic procedures to preserve the part of the image that wasn't corrupted, we get very good reconstructions. I mean, I'm gonna show you some examples. Okay, for example, here, if we take the image on the top left, we have removed a small part of it. And well, this hypoelliptic evolution, this anisotropic evolution that we are applying, yields the result on the right. And as you see, the, um, the hair of the eye are perfect, well, perfectly reconstructed, more or less, although we modified a lot the starting image. And the same thing is happening down here. Here we have some more problems, because of course, computing the lift in this image, since we have a lot of white part, gives some problems, some numerical problems. But Then, when we apply our heuristic procedures, essentially we can get very good reconstructions, as you see, for images that are highly corrupted. Okay, so from up to 85%, this diffusion pr performs much better than, for example, well, an isotropic diffusion on R2. Now, this is it for the in-painting. That's all I'm gonna say. I want to talk a little bit more about image recognition. So what we wanna do is essentially the following. We are given two images, that are F and G, and we pose ourselves the question, when, how can we tell if one is obtained from the other via rotor translations. As you see here, how can we tell that these two images are in fact the same image up to rotor translations? Now this is a very classical argument, of course. Classically, uh, it's done on a billion group, for example, and for example, in the case of R, if, well, this problem translates to simply trying to distinguish two images up to translation. And well, one notices, what one notices normally is that the translations performs pretty well under Fourier transform, so they just yield a phase that, so that gets out. And so one can prove the following result that is essentially that two images, two functions in R that are compactly supported, have some good properties on their Fourier transform, uh, can be recognized simply by the identity of these quantities here that is called the bispectral invariant that is pretty used in uh, various uh, in various areas of signal processing, for example, in music recognition. And, okay, one just to stress out that the fact that this thing is invariant under translation is pretty straightforward from the formula there, because we are killing the phase, essentially. But it's not at all immediately straightforward that this completeness of the result holds. Anyway, this is what we started with. We wanted to generalize it to the context of uh, the semi-discrete group of rotor translations. So how can we do that? Of course, we have to exploit the Fourier transform again. On this group, since it's non-commutative, we have a very clear picture of what is the Fourier transform, and this, this non-commutative Fourier transform, so if, in fact, instead of acting, well, in fact, the Pontryagin dual of our space, it's gonna be simply the set of equivalence classes of unitary irreducible representations, and there we can define our Fourier transform morally by the same formula as before, but this is gonna be, in our case in particular, where R is gonna be an n times n matrix, this is gonna be an n times n matrix as well on each representation. And then on this SE to N hat, on the Pontryagin dual, let's say, well, it's not a Pontryagin dual, but on the dual of this group, we can define a Planchard measure that allows for this Fourier transform to be an isometry, to be extended to an isometry. Now, the fundamental property that we had before with respect to translation is still preserved in the sense that if we apply the left regular representation to a function, we see its Fourier transform modified by the representation evaluated in the point. Okay, it's, it's A there, it should be XK, but, but we see, we can see it from the Fourier transform, this uh, action. So now, the first thing one can do is simply to, well, study this the dual of SE2N and see that it's essentially made up by finite dimensional representation. Well, at least the support of the Planchard measure is on n dimensional representations that are parametrized by a certain parameter lambda that lives in what we call the Camembert slice, essentially. So it's simply a slice of R2 of radius 2 pi over n. 
and this, uh, yeah, this S. And so this allows simply to generalize the bispectral invariance that we saw before uh, with this quite simple formula that yields, again, an operator, okay? So you see, instead of, well, if you rewrite this formula in the case of an abelian group, you will end up exactly with the bispectral invariance. Now, what we want to do is to prove a theorem that tells us that if this thing is equal for two functions, then the two functions are equal up to a certain action of the group. Now, this is doable in the sense that we have this theorem pretty easily under the assumption, well, not pretty easily, but under the assumption that the Fourier transform of a certain function on our group are invertible almost everywhere, we can get the same result. So we can get that phi is equal to psi times uh, the left diagonal representation if and only if b phi is equal to b psi. So if and only if the b spectral invariants are equal. Unfortunately, when we try to apply these two images, we have to put a left invariant lift in the, into play. And well, as a direct corollary of this theorem, we get a completeness theorem that is, vali that is valid only if LF of T lambda, so if the Fourier transform of the lifted function is indeed um, inv sorry, invertible almost everywhere. Now, this, unfortunately, is never the case for left invariant lifts because simple computations show you that if you write your left invariant lift using a, a wavelet, well, then its rank is going to be always at most one. So it's not going to be invertible, far from it. So this yields us essentially to define what are called the, what we call the rotational bispectral invariants that have a very similar face, well, are very similar to the bispectral invariants except for the fact that here we are rotating the second frequency, okay? So we, these are parameterized not only by lambda 1 and lambda 2, but also by k. And these are not anymore invariants by translation, unfortunately. So they are invariant by rotation. We can well, we can live with it because we can always translate images to a common center, for example, or something. So to take out the action of translations and just concentrate ourselves on rotations. So the theorem that we get in this case is that we have indeed a residual set of functions on L2. So that is well characterized. I mean, it's, it's always a property of their Fourier transforms. And on this set, any compactly supported function can be deduced by rotation from, the, from another if and only if their rotational bispectral invariants are equal. Now, I want to stress that the fact that we are working on, a, on the semi-discretized group is essential for this result in the sense that if we take SE2, so R2 semi-direct product with S1, we cannot prove these results with the techniques that we are using. And well, also that these bispectral invariants can be efficiently computed simply via the Fourier transform of the functions in R2. So this can be implemented in a very quick way, in a very nice way, and it permits to us to get some experimental results. Well, we just tested it on this coil 100 base. And here we see we, we essentially we fed an SVM with these uh, invariants, and we compared the results that we obtained with other invariants, like the Zernik moments and the Hue moments. And well, we performed slightly well with respect to them. And well, we hope to get more results soon, essentially. We would like to implement these things in another boost to actually extract the invariants that really keep the information about the rotations that we, we didn't understand well still. So, this is essentially what I wanted to tell. So thank you for your attention. And thank you. You start with the symmetry group as uh, consisting of translations and rotations. Yeah. Uh, but there is another operation that is uh, relevant, which is a mirroring. So when you flip, yeah. have you considered this too? Well, we looked into it. Uh, essentially, the results do not change because the, you can still write down the representation of this other group. And essentially, you get the same, well, with the same, 
Indeed, the result that I presented is a, is a general result for semi-direct product of some kind. So this should work also in that case. We didn't test it uh, on real images, let's say, but theoretically it should work. Uh, there is a theoretical uh, problem here because uh, this mirror operation uh, mm -hmm. leads to the fact that uh, the rotations and the mirroring uh, gives a uh, non-commutative uh, group, which means uh, that uh, the um, irrepresentation, uh, the irreducible uh, representations are not only one-dimensional, but could be two-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But so, yeah, so, yeah. So we should look. No, no, you're right. You're perfectly right. Perhaps another question? Okay. So I just uh, have one. Why, why do you discretize uh, on the angle uh, direction but not on the space? Uh well, that essentially is due to the fact, well, we looked also into discretization of the space, but of course, when you want to discretize R2, you don't have many choices. So either you stick, well, and then you have to have some compatibility between the discretization that you do downside and the rotation that you consider, of course. So essentially, it would restrict, that would restrict you to look at either a square grid and four, rota and four rotation that becomes two orientations, or an hexagonal thing and having three orientations or six rotations. So it's not as much. Well, actually, what we did for the invariance was done on a discretized grid of this type. So hexagonal grid and six rotations. But theoretically, especially for the diffusion, we would like to have much more uh, dif directions of diffusion, essentially. Otherwise, we would get uh, very sharp edges that we don't want. Okay, thank you very much.